ஓக்கிரதுண்டமகாய சூரியோட்டிசமப்பிரப நிர்விக்னம் குரு மே தேவ சர்வகாரியேஷுசர்வதி நமஸ்துபியம் வரதே காமிணி வித்யாரம்பம் கரிஷ்யாமி சித்தேர்பவத்து மே சதா குரவே சர்வோகாஷேவரோம் மிதயேவித்தியாமூர்த்தேத்மேதி மூர்த்திபேதிபாகினே வியோமவத்தேகாய தட்சிணாமூர்த்தேன ஆலயம் கருணாலயம் நமாமிபகவத்பாதம் சங்கரம் லோகசங்கரம் சதாசிவசமாரம்பாச்சாரியமியமாம் அஸ்மதாச்சாரியம் வந்தே குருபரம்பராம் சாட்சாத்தயானந்தம் பரமாணம் தத்வானப்பிரசாஸ்தாரம் பிரணத்தோஸ்மி பரம் பதம் ஓம் சகனாவது சகனோனக்து சகவீயங்கரவாவகை தேஜஸ்வினாவதிதமஸ்துமாவிஷாவகை ஓம் ஓம் பார்த்தாய பிரதிபோதிதாராயணேன யாசேனிதாம்ாரமுனாமதீம்ஷிணீம்வாமனுசந்தீபீ நமஸ்தேஸ்துவியாசவிஷாலபுத்தேனையாரதிந்தாயதபத்திரநேத்ரேனவ்யாரதைலபூர்ணபாரிஜாத்தாயோத்திரேத்ரைக்கேனமுத
ಬೋಧನಾಭೋದಿ ಲೋಕೆ ಸಜ್ಜನ ಷಟ್ಪೈರಹರಹೀಯಮಾನ ಮುದಾತ ಪಂಕಜ ಕಲಿಮಲ ಪ್ರಧ್ವಂಸಿ ನ ಶ್ರೇಯಸೆ ಮೂಕ ಕರೋತಿ ವಾಚಾಲ ಪಂಗು ಲಂಗಯತೆ ಗಿರಿ ಯತ್ಕೃಪಾತ್ತಮಹಂ ವಂದೇ ಪರಮಾನಂದ ಮಾಧವ ದಿಸ್ ಮಾಧವ ಇಸ್ ಮಿಸ್ಟೇಕ್ ನಾಟ್ ಮಾಧನವ ಮಾಧವ ಯಂ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮಾವರುಣೇಂದ್ರ ರುದ್ರಮರು ಸ್ತನ್ವಂತಿರ್ವ್ಯೈಸ್ತವ ೈ ಸಾಂಗಪದಕ್ರಮೋಪನಿಷದೈ ಗಾಯಂತಿ ಯಂ ಸಾಮಗಾ ಧ್ಯಾನವಸ್ಥಿತೇ ನ ಮನಸ ಪಶ್ಯಂತಿ ಯಂ ಯೋಗಿ ನಸ್ಯಾಂತಂ ನಿದುಸ್ಸುರಸುರಗಣಾಯತಸ್ಮೈ ನಮಃ ಮೀನಿಂಗ್ ಆಫ್ ದಟ್ ಶ್ಲೋಕಾಸ್ ವಿಲ್ ಬಿ ಸೀನ್ ಲೇಟರ್ ಐ ಟೆಲ್ ಯು ದಿ ಮೀನಿಂಗ್ ದೀಸ್ Shlokas were written by Madhusudhana Saraswati. Madhusudhana Saraswati has written a commentary on Bhagavad Gita, which is Udhartha Deepika, for which he has written the Dhyana Shlokas. So those Dhyana Shlokas are taken as Dhyana Shloka for chanting Bhagavad Gita also. These Shlokas are uh, wonderful and have excellent meaning, poetically. it is uh, the particular descriptions are there through the anushloka we are offering namaskara starting from ishvara to guru vyasa who is the author of the gita and the bhagavad gita herself so we are offering series of namaskaras to everyone guru namaskara is there gita namaskara is there and mahabharata that also the author of the mahabharata is also is to him also be offer of namaskara so it is a kartana shloka that meaning of those shlokas we will see later but now we can try to chant those shlokas you can practice so when we chant regularly the class surely you will memorize those shlokas so we will chant before every class okay now we will get into the class the last 22 classes we have seen the introduction introduction to the introduction to gita really it is an introduction to vedanta we have seen a variety of uh, topics starting from darshanam so those who have joined new they can listen to those classes so that will give an idea of what gita is what is the place of gita in what is the significance of gita and what way it is connected to our pursuit our moksha pursuit so those things are discussed were discussed in detail so taking into consideration our assumption that we are all familiar with the topics what we have discussed before so i will say i will i will say certain things during this class assuming that you are already familiar with those 
terms and uh, you know, technical terms as well as the, the 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 context the context of discussion right so certain things i have to assume we know that vedas are the pradhana pramana shastra we know that vedas they are the pramana shastra it is the pramana shastra the whole vedas the entire vedas are the pramana whether it is veda purva or veda anta you know the vedas can be divided into two parts two portions the first portion of the veda which is called veda purva the last portion that is vedanta veda purva deals with various rituals karma various rituals and prayers for the accomplishment of dharmartha kama dharmartha kama purushartha whereas vedanta deals with the knowledge of the the reality the knowledge of the truth vedanta is the last portion of the veda vedanam antaha it is a positional name given to given it's a positional name given therefore it is vedanta another name for vedanta is upanishads upanishads are also called vedanta why because the last portion of veda is nothing but the upanishads therefore upanishads vedanta is also called upanishads so upanishads means you have to understand it is the last portion of the veda vedanta so vedanta or upanishads both are same so whenever i use the word vedanta or upanishads it means the same the last portion of the veda is given is it's is as the content upanishads therefore upanishads are vedanta or vedanta means upanishads the very word upanishads etymologically if you see that which gives knowledge by giving knowledge it removes ignorance that is the etymological derivation of the meaning of the word upanishad upanishads give gnanam it gives upanishads give knowledge and the knowledge liberates you from samsara the bondage gnanena janma marana bandhana bandhat moksha by giving gnanam it gives you moksha from what from janma marana bandha from this cycle of janma and marana which is samsara from that it gives you moksha freedom by give by gnana if upanishads give moksha by giving gnana then i should read upanishad why should i read gita because what gita bhagavad gita teaches is not different from the teaching of the upanishads therefore gita is a moksha shastram therefore gita is a moksha shastram it is gita upanishad gita is also called gita upanishad it has a status of being the upanishad though gita doesn't come at the end portion of any veda it has a status of being a upanishad why because it gives gnanam and that gnanam liberates me from samsara therefore it is gita upanishad therefore gita is a moksha shastra moksha shastram and it is gita upanishad in the tradition there are three texts texts which are considered to be important and these three texts they form the they form the part of our traditional study of shastram there are so many texts available but these three form the foundation of enquiry into the teaching of the truth the reality 
and those three are called prasthana trayam prasthana trayam prasthana trayam trayam means three what are those three prasthanam i'll tell you the meaning later so trayam is there trayam means three the three foundational shastra what are they one is upanishads the second one bhagavad gita and the last one brahma sutra upanishad bhagavad gita and brahma sutra these three are the primary source of the teaching considered by the tradition and therefore they are called prasthanam upanishad bhagavad gita and brahma sutra these three are together called prasthana trayam trayam means three what is prasthanam prastiyate anena iti prasthanam that is the text by which pursuing which one gets atma gyanam self knowledge that is called prasthanam prastiyate anena pursuing which text one gets atma gyanam that is called prasthanam and there are three prasthanam upanishad bhagavad gita brahma sutra therefore prasthana trayam that is we pursue self knowledge atma gyanam with the help of these three texts therefore they are called prasthana trayam another meaning also can be given for prasthanam tattva gyanam that is atma gyanam brahma gyanam yasmin iti prasthanam tattva gyanam yasmin iti prasthanam that is the text which is based on the knowledge of truth the text which teaches which gives the knowledge of the truth of the reality that is prasthanam and the first prasthanam first text in the prasthana trayam it is upanishads upanishads is the first one upanishads we know they are part of the the veda the end part of the veda vedas are called shruti vedas are also called shruti why because shruti the very word shruti means shruyate shruyate iti shruti that which is heard that is shruti shravanam and all comes from the this only shru to listen that which is heard is called shruti by whom by whom by rishis so by rishis the teaching was received so rishis were the receivers of the teaching of the veda from whom they received they received from bhagwan from parameshwara from narayana himself rishis received the knowledge the very word rishi if you look at the word rishi it is derived from the the verbal root rish will be saying in our sanskritam class and that and some of you already know verbal root dhatu rish rish dhatu from that the word rishi comes rish means to know rish means to know therefore rishati janati iti rishi rishati pratham purusha ekavachana rishati the one who knows janati who knows is called rishi so rishi is one who knows knows what knows the truth of the reality how does rishi know how does rishi know the knowledge was revealed to them by parameshwara the one to whom the knowledge was revealed the one, the one who has received the knowledge in the form of listening hearing is called rishi hi from the word rishi only we get the word arsha 
Rishi is a word, from that only we get Arsha. Arsha Vidya Gurukulam. Arsha Vidya Varshini. That is the trust. Arsha. How do you get the word Arsha? From the word Rishi. You know that the Vriddhi letter of R, R is R. R is the Vriddhi letter of R. So in the word Rishi, R is there. So if you replace the word R by R, and all, something also it happens. So what will happen? What happens finally is it becomes Arsha. The Vriddhi of R is R, which replaces R in the Rishi. Then finally it becomes Arsha. That last E goes away, it becomes Arsha. So Arsha means Rishehe Idam. Rishehe Idam Arsham. That which belongs to Rishis. That which are obtained from Rishis. That is called Arsha. So Arsha Vidya. When we say this knowledge, this Vidya which was obtained by Rishis from Ishvara is called Arsha Vidya. The knowledge obtained by Rishis and transferred to the next successive generation, that knowledge obtained by Rishis and transferred, that Vidya is called Arsha Vidya, Vidya of the Rishis. The Rishis were the discoverer of the knowledge of the reality and it was revealed to Rishis by Parameshwara. Therefore, the knowledge is called, that Veda Vidya is called Arsha Vidya and that is the Mola Pramanam. That is the Mola Pramanam. Understand, these, this knowledge was obtained by Rishis, not written by Rishis. Rishis were not the inventors of this knowledge. They only discovered it, like Newton discovered gravity. Newton did not discover gravity. He didn't create gravity. It was already there. It was discovered by them. Before Newton discovered, the gravity was there. Millions of years before even gravity was there, Newton only discovered it. Similarly, this knowledge also were there. But to whom it was revealed? Rishis. Therefore, it's called Arsha Vidya. Therefore, this is Vedas are not man-made. It is Apurishayam. It is not created by any human being. They are not written. Therefore, Apurishayam. Therefore, this Apurishaya Mula Pramanam Veda is called Shrutihi. Now you understand why it is called Shrutihi. This Apurishaya Mula Pramanam is called Shrutihi. What is a Mula Pramanam? Veda. So that is the first prasthanam. That is a first prasthanam. So the whole Veda is called Shrutihi. But here we are dealing with the last portion of the Veda, Vedanta. We are not interested in Veda Purva. If you are interested in Dharmartha Kama, then Veda Purva, we have to deal with. But we are interested in Moksha. Therefore, we deal with the last portion, that is Vedanta, otherwise called Upanishads. Which are the Shruti Prasthanam, the first Prasthanam, Shruti Prasthanam, otherwise called Shrauta Prasthanam. We can call it as a Shruti Prasthanam or Shrauta Prasthanam. So Upanishads are the Shruti Prasthanam. That is number one among the Prasthanatrayam, that is the first one. The second one is Gita, Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita presents the same teaching of the Upanishads. Teaching is not different. The same teaching in the form of a dialogue between Bhagavan Krishna and Arjuna. And this Bhagavad Gita, this dialogue in the form of verses or in Mahabharata. Mahabharata, is it Paurusheyam or Apaurusheyam? It was it, it was it done by a man or it naturally was there? It was written. Mahabharata was written by a particular person, Veda Vyasa. Vyasa Acharya wrote Mahabharata. Therefore, Gita, which is in Mahabharata, it is Paurusheyam. It is Paurusheyam. 
though the teaching of the gita is the teaching of the upanishads but it was reproduced in the form in a, in a form of dialogue between krishna and arjuna in the form of gita by vyasacharya therefore it is paurusheyam the knowledge is not paurusheyam the knowledge what the gita reveals it is not paurusheyam it is apaurusheyam but what gita does is it restates what is already taught by the upanishads therefore it is the text is paurusheyam the knowledge is apaurusheyam only the teaching of the upanishads is remembered by gita how by, by restating by restating it remembers that is why gita is called smritihi gita is called smritihi the the very word smriti it comes from the verbal root smr smr means to remember smr smaryate smarati to remember gita remembers the teaching of the upanishad therefore gita is a smriti grantha gita is a smriti grantha upanishads are the shruti grantha shruti is remembered therefore smriti therefore gita is smriti prasthanam bhagavad gita is smriti prasthanam bhagavad gita is given the status of prasthanam like the shruti that is why it is called gita akaranta strilinga shabda gita shruti is that is also strilinga shabda ikaranta strilinga shabda shruti gita is also strilinga shabda only actually it should be bhagavad geetam geetam that is it should be napum sakalinga word why it is called gita because gita has the status of being a prasthanam like the shruti which is a strilinga shabda shruti therefore it became gita it became instead of becoming bhagavad geetam it became bhagavad geeta that also has become strilinga shabda so that is itself indicates geeta is geeta is also the prasthanam that is also considered to be the pramana pramanam it is given the status of shruti like the shruti that equivalent status of shruti that is why that is also considered to be a an important script shastram to be studied with to be studied that that is why it is smriti prasthanam geeta is smriti prasthanam and the last one is the last the text is brahma sutra brahma sutra is a sutra work sutra work done by vyasacharya this brahma sutra deals with the last portion of the veda so that the, the last portion of the veda is given in the form of sutra sutra means that aphorism the form of aphorism there are 555 sutras the teaching of the upanishads is given in the form of sutra by vyasacharya and the first portion of the veda veda purva that is also given in the form of sutra by jaimani maharishi that is purva mimamsa sutra purva mimamsa sutra so we are not interested in purva mimamsa sutra we are interested in vedanta therefore brahma sutra is also considered to be the one of the prasthanam the whole teaching of the upanishads which is systematically presented by vyasacharya in the form of sutra therefore it is also a prasthanam what is the necessity for vyasacharya to present in the form of a sutra because the the upanishads don't present the teaching systematically if you read upanishads on your own you will be in problem that is why it should be taught by a teacher in the upanishads if there is no presentation of the teaching in an order and the brahma sutra it presents the teaching systematically and also gives logical support to establish the teaching 
So Brahma Sutra is a logical analysis, logical analysis of the teaching of the Upanishads. And therefore, it is called Nyaya Prasthana. Nyaya Prasthana. Please don't confuse the word Nyaya Prasthana with Nyaya Darshanam. Nyaya Darshanam, that Nyaya philosophy. The Nyaya philosophy was propounded by Akshapada Gautama. That is different. That is a, one of the Darshanam that we have seen, one of the Astika Darshanam, that is different. We are not talking about Nyaya Darshanam, Nyaya Prasthanam. Here, Nyaya is logic. Logic in keeping with the Shastra. Lo Nyaya means logic or reasoning, which is in keeping with the, the Shastra. So, Nyaya is not a system of thought here. Here, it means the, the logic or reasoning in keeping with the, the Shastra. And Brahma Sutra, it ascertains the, the teaching, the Tatparya of the Vedas with the help of reasoning, logical reasoning, Brahma Sutra. And Brahma Sutra, it has three purposes. It has three main purposes. What are they? Number one. It ascertains the Tatparya, the essential teaching. Tatparya means the essential teaching. It ascertains the Tatparya of the Vedanta Vakyas, of all the Vedanta Vakyas in Brahman only. So, all the Vedanta Vakyas have their Tatparya in establishing Brahman, Ishvara. Brahman means Ishvara, Parameshwara. And number two, Brahma Sutra, it shows the limitations of other darshanas, other philosophies. Darshanam means philosophy. But darshanam is a better word than philosophy. We don't have to use the word philosophy. We will use the Sanskrit word darshanam. And the third thing is, Brahma Sutra, it answers the objection raised by the other darshanam and it dismisses all the opponents. Opponents are called Purva Pakshis. <coughs> so, Brahma Sutra, it answers all the objections raised by the, the opponents and dismisses them and dismisses their conclusions. So, these are the main three things which Brahma Sutra studies. To study Brahma Sutra, therefore, one must have studied all the major ten Upanishads on the Gita. Brahma Sutra being the Nyaya Prasthanam, unless you have the knowledge of the Upanishads and the Gita, you will not understand. And what are those ten Upanishads? Isha Kena Kata Prashna Mundama Dukya Tittirihi Aita Regyam Chachandogyam Dragadaran Nyakam Tata all the ten Upanishads are named here. And also Gita also to be included. So, if, you are, if your goal is to read Brahma Sutra, then you have to do a lot of homework. And in Brahma Sutra, <coughs> Vyasacharya, you will find, you, he has rephrased the statements of the Upanishads in the form of Sutra. In the form of a sutra and sutra as such cannot be understood it has to be interpreted by someone and that job bhagavad pada has done shankar bhagavad pada has written a beautiful commentary on brahma sutra if you are studying brahma sutra if you are studying brahma sutra it means you are studying brahma sutra with the bhashyam with the commentary of shankar bhagavad pada Without commentary, you cannot understand Brahma Sutra. And in the commentary, Bhagavad Pada has quoted from the 10 major Upanishads and also from the Gita, in addition to other quotations Bhagavad Pada has given. Therefore, to read Brahma Sutra with Shankara Bhashyam, one has to, one, one should have the knowledge of all the 10 Upanishads and Gita. Before venturing to the study of Brahma Sutra, you must have sufficient knowledge of the Upanishads and the Gita. 
otherwise brahma sutra will not be understood and in brahma sutra through brahma sutra vyasacharya and the the bhashyakara bhagavad pada they have established that all the upanishads they have the commitment in establishing the same teaching is jeeveshwara aikya the essential oneness of jeevatma and paramatma that is the tatparya of all the upanishads not that each upanishad has got different tatparya no to establish that that, that the tatparya of all the upanishads are the same bhagavad pada has written commentary on the brahma sutra so when you want to establish then bhagavad pada has to quote from the many upanishads therefore we need knowledge of the upanishads and also gita so brahma sutra is the one of the important text which is a nyaya prasthanam for which acharya bhagavad pada has written a commentary by that commentary he establishes the truth of the reality the truth of the reality being advaita non duality therefore the arrive, arriving at the advaita arriving at the advaita the conclusion being advaita through logical reasoning in keeping with the shastram it is called nyaya prasthanam which is brahma sutra so among the three prasthanams what are we interested now we are interested in bhagavad gita which is the smriti prasthanam and for this smriti prasthanam bhagavad pada has written a, a commentary literally speaking the commentary on gita should be called vyakhyanam technically speaking the, the commentary on gita should be called vyakhyanam but it is called bhashyam the commentary written by bhagavad pada it's called shankara bhashyam it is given it is called bhashyam why because the gita has a status of being a shruti shruti prasthanam the commentary is also called bhashyam not vyakhyanam the commentary on upanishad is called bhashyam and gita being nothing but upanishad gita upanishad therefore the commentary is called bhashyam and we will see when we study gita we will see in line with shankar bhashyam because to study shankar bhashyam word by word we need a lot of sanskrit knowledge but we will study gita in line with what bashikara says therefore now we understand the gita is a pramana grantha it is a main source of knowledge the primary source of knowledge because we have accepted gita as a pramanam now we can study gita for atma gyanam self knowledge why do we need self knowledge what am i going to do with atma gyanam if you ask already we have discussed though we have discussed i will tell again why do we study why do we need atma gyanam our vyavahara our vyavahara means transaction transaction with the with the world with the people with the situations in life all whatever transaction you do with the world they are all vyavahara our vyavahara it is based on based on a fundamental error all our transactions with the world are based on a fundamental error in fact our the whole transaction and the life you see it's full of errors full of errors one after the other we have a lot of errors 
and bhagavad pada he unfolds how there is error in our vyavahara how that error manifests in our vyavahara and in his adhyasa bhashyam in brahma sutra yes and he, un he has unfolded so beautifully it is a masterpiece that adhyasa bhashyam of brahma sutra is a excellent bhashyam and there he establishes the the errors committed by the human beings which is the cause of samsara he says the error is not possible it is impossible to commit the error but we have made it possible the error which is impossible to commit is made possible by us how very simple i am the subject i am the subject so the word for i is aham aham is the subject and idam means the object aham subject idam is object aham is i myself so anything other than me other than aham is idam objects so how many subjects are there only one subject which is aham i anything other than me they are all idam the objects the objects of the world the people the body your own body your mind and senses they are all objects and they are all opposed to the subject because they cannot become the subject they are they cannot become the subject and that you cannot uh, the object cannot be object cannot be subject subject being only one and everything else being object object cannot replace the subject for example you see you 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 see your mobile phone you are not the mobile phone you see the mobile phone i see the mobile phone i see the laptop but i am not the laptop i see the body but i cannot be the i cannot be the body because body is available for my perception similarly i see the thoughts in my mind but i cannot be the thoughts they are also idam object only but when i say i am fat i am weak i am angry i am angry when you say what i did was i have made both the subject and object into one i didn't distinguish the subject and the object what happened when i when i said i am angry it means both the subject and the object they have become one they cannot become one but i have made it one when i say i am fat i am tall i am short i made the impossible possible therefore there is vyavahara when i when i am the body then i can say this is my son this is my daughter this is my father this is my mother and these are my friends all the errors inexplicable continuous errors are committed by this one error and this is the error with reference to atma atma is that is myself the reality of myself so this is the error we commit and therefore it clearly shows there is agnyanam of atma atma agnyan ignorance of atma is there and shastram confirms that you have ignorance and therefore error when shastram say that you are sachit ananda atma that when the shastram say that itself shows that i don't know i am sachit ananda atma and my own, my experience with that with the world itself shows it confirms that i am not such in such sachidananda atma if i am sachidananda atma then i will not be suffering but i suffer and if i ask you if i ask you do you know that you are the cause of this universe you are a limitless consciousness naturally you will say i don't know so that itself shows that error is there and ignorance is there and in spite of this fundamental error we are able to do our daily transaction with the world in the form of perceptions inference 
like any other being. For example, a cow doesn't have Atma Jnana, but it does all its Vivagaras. If you show a bunch of grass to the cow, it will come towards you. If you take a stick in your hand, it just goes away. So we are also on the same footing like any other being. Only difference between the animals and the human being is animals are less conscious of themselves, whereas we are fully conscious. We have, as a human being, we have complex complexes. We have judgment about ourselves and also about others. We have a lot of misconceptions about ourselves, the, at the Atma. And that leads to a life full of suffering and sorrow. But there is a desire to come out from this life of samsara. That desire is also is there. And for that person who has a desire to come out from this life of samsara, Bhagavad Gita provides solution how? By revealing your true nature, by giving you the self knowledge. And when that knowledge happens in you, you become free. And that is the knowledge Gita presents, and, and the Gita is in the form of a dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna. It is located in Mahabharatam. So, Smriti Prasthanam, which is Gita, is locate, as location in Mahabharatam. So, Mahabharatam, it, is it Shruti or Smriti? We know Mahabharata written by Vyasacharya. Mahabharatam is an Itihasa. It's an epic. The word iti, Itihasa, iti ha asa. We can split that. Iti ha asa. It means in this way it happened. What happened? The story. The whole Mahabharata, it is it is not just uh, imaginary. You know stories a lot of stories are there they're not just imaginary it is historical it has got some historical proof and the author would have probably it's uh, no it is imagination also but it has historical evidence so therefore it is called iti ha asa itihasa so mahabharatam is a itihasa and this great itihasa it has one lakh, one lakh shlokas. And in that Mahabharata, Gita, Bhagavad Gita, which is the, the subject of our study, is located in Bhishma Parva. Parva means section. So Bhishma Parva, in the Bhishma Parva, Starting from the 25th chapter and ending with the 42nd chapter, Bhagavad Gita is there. So, therefore, Bhagavad Gita has how many chapters? 18 chapters. So, starting from the 25th chapter, ending with the 42nd chapter, the whole 18 chapters are called Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavataha Gita, the words of the Bhagavan. Therefore, it is Bhagavad Gita. And how many chapters Bhagavad Gita has? 18 chapters. And this number, 18, it has some significance. If you see in Mahabharata, this 18, the number 18, it has some significance. Mahabharata has got another name. Another name, Jaya. Jayam means Mahabharata. The shloka, what you see now, the word Jayam comes. Narayanam namaskritya naranchaiva narottamam devim saraswatim vyasam tato Jayam udirayet. That Jayam, Jayam is another name for Mahabharata. And therefore, Mahabharata is a Jaya Shastram. Jayam also means victory. Jaya, Jaya means victory. And Jaya also stands for the number 18. 
how you can ask how does it mean 18 you have to pay attention now i will show you something you can see there is something called katapayadi sankhya katapayadi sankhya is a numbering system a particular numbering system which is there katapayadi sankhya in that katapayadi sankhya all the sanskrita sanskrita letters they are they got numbers they are numbered for example you see the first line ka kha ga gha na cha cha ja ja nya starting from ka ending with nya it is numbered 1 to 10 it means ka number is 1 the number of kha is 2 the number of 3 number of ga is 3 Similarly, you have to assign each number to each letter. So, 1 to 10. 10 letters are there and 10 numbers are there. So, each letter to be assigned one number. So, that number is the numbering system. That, that letter ka means 1. Okay. And the last letter nya means number 10. Similarly, the next one. Ta, tha, da, tha, na. The, 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 na. All these cerebrals and dental letters are there. That is also given the number 1 to 10. So, ta is 1, ta is 2, da is 3, similar, similarly. And the, the label, pa, pa, bha, bha, ma. It is numbered 1 to 5. So, pa is 1, ma is Five. Similarly, all the letters have got the numbers now. And the semi vowels and the sibilance, they also numbered. They are also numbered 1 to 8. Ya is 1, Ra is 2, La is 3, Va is 4. So, Ya, Ra, La, Va, Sha, Sha, Sa, Ha. All the letters are numbered. Now, when we say, when I said Jaya means victory that is one meaning of the word jaya which is jaya another name for mahabharata and if you calculate the the number associated with jaya what is the number of ja ja it is in the first line ja is eight number eight kha kha ga gha nga cha cha ja so one two three four five six seven eight so ja letter the corresponding number for ja is eight and what about ya ya is the first letter in the semi bubble it stands for the number one so jaya means 81 and you reverse 81 what you get 18 so jaya means 18 so this is a type of a numbering system by which we can get the numbers associated with the letter as well as the word. So Mahabharatam being called Jaya, Jaya, now Jaya means 18 and this 18 has got significance. You will see more, uh, more of number 18 in, uh, in Mahabharatam. You can see now Mahabharata you know, it is a that's one lakh verses, and it has eighteen chapters. Mahabharata and, and Gita, Mahabharata, uh, Mahabharata has got eighteen chapters, and Gita has also got eighteen chapters. Now, the Mahabharata, it has eighteen. We call it as a chapters or section. It is sections. Parva, parva means uh, parva means a section. Or you can call it as a chapter also. So there are 18 parvas in Mahabharata. Adi parva, Sabha parva, Aranyaka parva, that is the order. You have to read horizontally. Adi parva, Sabha parva, Aranyaka parva, Virata parva, Udyoga parva, Bhishma parva. In Bhishma parva only, Bhagavad Gita is located. Drona parva, Karna parva, Shalya parva, Sautika Parva, Sri Parva, Shanti Parva, Anushasana Parva, Ashwamedika 
பருவ ஆசிரம வாசிக்க பருவ மௌசல பருவ மகா பிரஸ்தானிக பருவ ஸ்வர்காரோகண பருவ எயிட்டீன் பருவா சார்ந்த மகாபாரதம் அண்ட் who is the main teacher in mahabharata the teach not main teacher he is the only teacher bhagwan krishna is the the teacher he is a teacher and the student is arjuna the teacher has got 18 names in the bhagavad gita you will find all the 18 names of gita i mean krishna gita bhagavad gita it uses these 18 names of bhagwan krishna அச்சுத கிருஷ்ண கேசவ கோவிந்த மதுசூதன மாதவ ஜனார்தன ஹரிசூதன வார்ஷ்ணேய புருஷோத்தம பகவன் ஏ பகவன் கமலபத்ராட்ச ஜகத்பதே ஜெகந்நிவாச விஷ்ணோ ரிஷிகேஷ வாசுதேவ யாதவ you can remember some of the shlokas the shlokas it comes purushottama kamalapatraksha that it comes in 11th chapter jagatpate jagan nivasa all these things so these are the 18 names of krishna used in mahabha is in bhagavad gita and who is a disciple arjuna and arjuna is also addressed by 18 names anagha arjuna bharatarishaba ಭರತಸತ್ತಮ ಭರತಶ್ರೇಷ್ಠ ಧನಂಜಯ ಗುಡಾಕೇಶ ಕಪಿಧ್ವಜ ಕೌಂತೇಯ ಕಿರೀಟಿ ಗುರುನಂದನ ಗುರುಶ್ರೇಷ್ಠ ಮಹಾಭಾಗೋ ಪಾಂಡವ ಪಾರ್ಥ ಪರಂತಪ ಪುರುಷ ವ್ಯಾಘ್ರ ಸದ್ಯಸಾಚಿನ್ ಸದ್ಯಸಾಚಿ ಆಂಬಿ ಟೆಕ್ಸ್ಟರ್ಸ್ ದೀಸ್ ಆರ್ ದಿ ದಿ ಏಟೀನ್ ನೇಮ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಅರ್ಜುನ ಯು ವಿಲ್ ಫೈಂಡ್ ಇನ್ gita not only that and there there in mahabharata the war is between the pandava and the kaurava pandavas they had seven akshovinis akshovini akshohini means akshohini akshohini means army units pandava had seven army units and kaurava had 11 akshohini 11 army units so 7 plus 11 18 and how many days the war you know happened 18 days the, the war mahabharata war lasted for 18 days the first 10 days bhishma was there and the next 5 days drona he was the commander in chief after drona the two days by karna In the last day one day by shalya so 18 days of war and in gita bhagavad gita itself how many chapters 18 chapters are there the first four chapters the four I mean the four chapters deals with jnana karma sanyasa five chapters deal with karma sanyasa and five chapters with jnana vidyana yoga so that also 18 chapters so the 18 as the significance of 18 you can see there are many things which are 18 18 18 in mahabharata and and the word jaya itself stands for 18 so now you you know the significance of the number 18 associated with mahabharata itself and in the mahabharata bhagavad gita is located and it starts from the 25th chapter of the bhishma parva the real teaching of bhagavad gita the actual teaching it starts from only from the second chapter from the second chapter 11th shloka only the teaching starts the first chapter of the bhagavad gita it gives the base it provides the, the base the context for the successive chapters the successive chapters are nothing but the teaching so that it the first chapter provides the the base for the teaching so and therefore to 
the first chapter to get into the first chapter before getting into the first chapter we should know the context in which gita happened to be born the first chapter provides a base for the teaching fine but what is the base for the first chapter what is the context in which the gita teaching was given or was about to be given that we should know for that we should know the the whole background the background of gita should be known for that we have to travel to astinapura you have to travel with me to astinapura that is the story starts from astinapura astinapura is a great kingdom was a great kingdom ruled by the king shantanu so shantanu he was a king and we have to start the story through that i will give the background the birth of bhagavad gita so therefore we have to start the story of mahabharata from shantanu which i will tell in the the next class i will try to complete i try to give the whole story starting from shantanu ruling astinapura and up to the battle of kurukshetra as far as possible i will make it short and try to complete in one class in the next class after which we will get into the, the first chapter of bhagavad gita so with this a brief introduction we will stop our today's class the next class we will see the story part of bhagavad gita the context in which the bhagavad gita was born we will see Om Pur Namadaf Pur Namitam Pur Nar Pur Namudachyate Asya Pur Namadaya Pur Eva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Harihi Om Shri Vyodhya Namaha Harihi Om धन्यवाद जी धन्यवाद